Stanislav Grof is a clinical psychiatrist and an internationally recognized authority on the use of non-ordinary states of consciousness in psychotherapy. He has written a number of books, including The Adventure of Self-Discovery and The Holotropic Mind. Together, he and his wife, Christina, wrote Beyond Death and The Stormy Search for the Self. My name is Walter Mead. I visited with Dr. Groff in California to learn more about his work. He has spent almost 40 years studying non-ordinary states of consciousness, an area that is almost completely ignored by academic psychiatry. I asked him why he felt this was so interesting. I believe that the study of non-ordinary states is absolutely essential for the understanding of the psyche, of uh, human nature, uh, and possibly even for, for the nature of reality. What exactly are non-ordinary states of consciousness? I mean, how would you describe them? Non-ordinary states of consciousness are uh, powerful experiences which are characterized by uh, very intense changes of uh, the sensory perception, perceptual changes, uh, by very powerful uh, emotions, by changes in thought processes, and they're frequently accompanied also by some significant uh, psychosomatic changes. And as far as the content of these experiences is concerned, uh, it frequently is very spiritual, can be mystically oriented. People would have experiences involving sequences of death and uh, rebirth, spiritual rebirth, experiences of uh, cosmic oneness, uh, past life experiences, um, experiences with uh, mythological beings, with, with deities, with, with demons, uh, many, many of the kinds of experiences that we read about in the spiritual scriptures and, and the mystical literature of the world. Actually, what is, what is very interesting is that uh, uh, the Western industrial civilization is the only group in the entire uh, human history that doesn't um, hold non-ordinary states in, in great esteem and doesn't have any use for them, actually has pathologized them. Every other culture has spent a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to develop ways of, of uh, inducing non-ordinary states. And they cover a very, very wide uh, range. Uh, so, for example, many cultures would uh, develop trance-inducing music, which could be um, drumming, which could be rattling, uh, or use of sticks or some other uh, instruments. Uh, this could be various forms of uh, chanting, uh, singing performances, uh, like, for example, uh, the Kachak, the Balinese monkey chant, or the, the Inuit Eskimo, uh, they have uh, what they call throat music, the Inuit Eskimo throat music, uh, the Sufi chants, uh, the, in, the Hindus have what's called bhajans or kirtans, uh, the Tibetans or the Mongolians have um, multivocal chanting. So this, those are all uh, ways of, of using music uh, you know, for inducing uh, trance states. Mu uh, another way is rhythmic dancing, whirling of the uh, of the dervishes. Uh, some cultures use, uh, for example, fasting, uh, um, deprivation of water, uh, sleep deprivation, even severe physical pain, like, uh, for example, Lakota Sioux uh, Sundance, or, or some of the Australian Aborigines using uh, sub-incision of the penis and some other, some other you know, pretty, pretty intense uh, physical exercises. Uh, the Mayans, uh, the ancients, and even even um, contemporary Mayans, bloodletting is another severe bloodletting is another way of inducing uh, these states. Uh, and of course, then we have the entire spiritual tradition: the different forms of yoga, the Taoist exercises, uh, the kinds of means that have been developed over the centuries in Tibet. Extremely sophisticated ways of of changing consciousness. Uh, Christian prayer, Jesus' prayer, and so on. So these other cultures obviously find these valuable, but in what context? I mean, how do they use these non-ordinary states as part of their culture? Well, they use, use them for a variety of reasons. I would say the primary reason is that these states can connect you to other levels of reality, to supernal forces of various kinds. So they used it as a way of connecting with deities, 
uh, with uh, the world of nature, with forces of nature, uh, connecting with uh, animals. Uh, for many, for many cultures, uh, non-ordinary state represent really um, you know, religious practice, spiritual, spiritual practice. That is the religion that they have, and what they experience in different rituals, in different uh, ceremonies. Another very, very significant way of or, or reason for using uh, non-ordinary states is diagnosing diseases and healing diseases. So many of the shamanic practices, many of the uh, spiritual healing rituals of Aboriginal cultures involve non-ordinary states. For, for these cultures, healing is always connected with non-ordinary state. Oh, it, amazing. Yeah, I mean, either the, the client is in a non-ordinary state, or the healer, or both of them, or you have a situation where an entire tribe or a group of people would go into non-ordinary states, like an example would be, for example, that wonderful, powerful dance of the Kalahari Bushmen, where they, when they drum and dance rhythmically in a circle, and then a certain kind of healing energy is released in the sacred area, which is interesting because it's a similarity to the Eastern concept of Kundalini, mm -hmm. where the cosmic energy also is in a kind of dormant form in the sacral area. And among the Kalahari Bushmen, the dance kind of uh, uh, awakens this energy and then it flows and then creates powerful emotional responses, powerful physical uh, responses and significant healing happens for, for the entire group of people who participate. Um, one more uh, would be used for cultivating intuition, uh, extra sen sensory perception. You know, they use it for uh, finding lost objects or lost... Uh, persons uh, or knowing what's happening in another location and so on and also artistic inspiration it sounds like other cultures throughout history have found non-ordinary states of consciousness so valuable why do we so systematically ignore them in our culture well i think something very significant happened historically um, uh, when um, and the industrial revolution and the scientific revolution came about 300 years ago uh, in England, uh, suddenly there was tremendous emphasis on rationality, understanding everything with your reason. Uh, what emerged somehow for science was something that's called today the Newtonian-Cartesian paradigm, which is based on the work of uh, uh, René Descartes and Isaac Newton. Um, Isaac Newton's idea that uh, space is uh, three-dimensional, time is linear, uh, matter is indestructible, made of atoms, uh, and that um, somehow the whole uh, universe is a mechanical system. And the, the Cartesian uh, uh, element that was added to it uh, was a separation between the mind and, uh, and um, the material aspects uh, of the world. So we got this, uh, this marriage of the Newtonian elements of the Cartesian elements of and of materialistic philosophy, and this way of thinking about the world proved to be extremely useful in physics and had a lot of uh, technological applications and really transformed uh, the world into what we know now. And this way of thinking in physics uh, gained such prestige that it then was applied to all the other disciplines. And the, the tendency was to understand everything uh, rationally in materialistic terms. And these other experiences, then, you know, that would take you into uh, transrational domains, into, into the mystical, spiritual domains, were suddenly seen as kind of uh, embarrassing leftovers of the Dark Ages that we have to that sort of uh, get away from. And they were, the experiences were relegated into the realm of uh, psychopathology, something that ultimately will be understood in terms of brain pathology. And so if we, if we look at it more specifically now, um, for example, when they came back with psychedelics, uh, the culture was completely unprepared uh, for the advent of, of uh, these substances, and also the profession was, was um, unprepared. For example, psychotherapy was really disciplined talking at a table face to face, or lying on the couch and uh, free associating. 
And if people started emoting too much, if they started moving too much, that was called acting out, something that doesn't belong to psychotherapy. And of course what was happening in psychedelic sessions was very shamanic, was very dramatic. And so it somehow seemed to uh, people and to professionals in particular to be reminiscent more of what we see in psychopathology or what we see in these uh, primitive cultures. This is what savages do, something that we have uh, outgrown as civilized people. And the other serious reason why it was so difficult to accept the, uh, the non-ordinary states, you know, experience in psychedelics and then later in many other non-drug ways, was that uh, many of those experiences um, in principle shouldn't have happened. Is if the universe is the way it's described by Western science, these experiences sh should not be possible in principle. So if we structure our entire reality around the Newtonian-Cartesian paradigm, and something comes along that just doesn't fit, we don't know what to do with it. So we have to ignore it, or say that it doesn't exist, because it would be irrational or unscientific to acknowledge the existence of something that doesn't yes. quite fit the model. Yes, and this has then tremendous implications for psychiatry because we have this currently this very narrow model which is limited to the body and then the brain in particular for psychiatry and then in terms of what we could call software in computer language which is the program then we limit that to um, postnatal history what happened to us after we were born in infancy in childhood and then uh, the Freudian individual unconscious which also is a derivative of the individual history. So we don't include, for example, uh, birth. We don't include the prenatal life. And we certainly don't include the, what we call now, transpersonal domain, something going beyond the personal, which is the spiritual, the mystical, uh, or the archetypal domain, as Carl Gustav Jung would, would call it, the mythological domain. So the psychiatrists today are sort of stuck in a model that won't explain a lot of what they observe. But if they acknowledge that these other realms of consciousness exist, they seem unscientific or irrational. One of the criticisms of modern psychiatry is that there are so many different interpretations of the same data. I mean, you go to 10 therapists and you get 10 different interpretations of what's wrong with you and how to heal you. Very much. This is a very, to me, this is a very uh, um, distressing situation in the psychiatric profession that we have, for example, so many school, uh, schools of deep uh, or depth psychology. You know, f the Freudian, the Adlerian, the Reiki, and the, the Jungian, the followers of Karen Horna, and the, the Sullivanian, uh, uh, Lacanian, I mean, you, you name it. And as you were saying, if we have a problem, we can, we can flip a coin and choose a school, and with every school comes a different picture as to how the psyche functions, why the symptoms are there, and with each school comes a very different uh, technique that you supposedly do as a scientific way of getting rid of that particular problem. And the strange thing that it even doesn't bother us. You don't think it's very peculiar. Can you imagine uh, chemistry? Chemists having 50 schools and, and <laughs> arguing about what happens when you put two substances in a test tube. We wouldn't uh, have much appreciation for chemistry as science if this were the case. This could explain some of the distrust of psychiatry that we see in contemporary culture. Your view is that if psychiatrists systematically ignore perinatal or transpersonal experiences, that they are working with insufficient data to ever come up with a model that will work. Yes, I, I believe that Western psychiatry and psychology, they have a very inadequate, very superficial model of the psyche. And that the main reason is that we have systematically ignored the evidence that comes from the study of non-ordinary states. Whether we talk about uh, these states in the context of uh, comparative religion, for example, uh, in the context of anthropology, what happens in, in healing rituals or, or uh, shamanic rituals, whether we talk about it um, in the context of, uh, of the great spiritual traditions, uh, yoga, you know, Taoism, uh, uh, Christian mysticism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, or even in terms of uh, some uh, modern discoveries. You know, we have tremendous amount of data generated from thanatology, the experiences of people who come close to death. We have tremendous amount of data coming from uh, psychedelic research, 
from uh, what's called sensory deprivation, where people were in situations where they don't get any sensory input, for example, in a um, tank, submerged in a tank in darkness, uh, where there is uh, the same temperature as the, the body, no sounds, and so on. We have tremendous uh, uh, amount of data about these states, and um, also the observations from, from experiential psychotherapy, and yet they have not been taken into consideration, they have not been assimilated in mainstream thinking. It's as if this whole area simply doesn't exist. The, the profession, the academic uh, circles, they keep perpetuating this uh, 17th century uh, Cartesian-Newtonian thinking. Now I have to ask you the key question. If we devised a model of the psyche that would take into consideration mystical experiences, information from trance states or transpersonal realms, and that would respect and honor all human experiences, and would respect the ancient traditions, what would a model like that look like? That would be very different uh, psychiatry and psychology, and I can think about, you know, at least um, certainly four or five domains in which we would have to radically change our thinking. Um, first of them would be uh, the model of the psyche. We would not uh, be able to have a model that's limited to the brain and the postnatal history and the individual unconscious. We will have to create much more uh, extensive model, uh, much, much different understanding of the dimensions of human consciousness. The second area would be we would get a totally different understanding of uh, emotional and psychosomatic disorders, those which are psychologically caused, not those that are organically caused. We're not talking about tumors or, or um, infections or degenerative uh, processes in the brain, but those that are, uh, as we call, psychogenic or psychogenetic. And the third uh, area where we would have to significantly change our thinking would be uh, the nature of the healing process and the, the strategy of self-exploration, the, the strategy of therapy. Uh, another area, we would have to totally change our um, attitude to spirituality, which, you know, at, at, the pre at present, uh, psychiatry would consider to be uh, related to superstition, to uh, lack of scientific education, to magical, primitive, uh, thinking, or if people have spiritual experiences, they would get labels uh, uh, like, uh, you know, psychosis, schizophrenia, and so on. So we would have to accept spirituality as a very natural component in the human psyche and in the universal scheme of things. And uh, the last revision would be very, very fundamental. This would not be just uh, a revision of the thinking in psychology and psychiatry but uh, we would have to change the entire philosophy of Western science, particularly in relation to the role of consciousness, the nature of consciousness, the relationship between matter and consciousness, and then more specifically, the relationship between consciousness and the brain. Let's talk about the first area you mentioned, the restructuring of our understanding of the psyche, the cartography of human consciousness. You've developed a model that involves not only the biographic data, but also includes perinatal data and information from the transpersonal realm. Perhaps you could describe this model. Yeah, those are subjects for entire volume, so I'll do my best to, to condense it. Um, I tried um, very early in my psychedelic research, you see, to create a cartography that would somehow uh, have place for all the types and levels of experiences that come in uh, non-ordinary states. And I ended up um, with a cartography that has uh, two additional levels or domains to the one which we are using in um, Western psychology, which is basically the biographical or the recollective level and the level of the individual unconscious. Uh, I originally thought that I was working on a new map for psychology which was made possible by this powerful catalyst, this tool, which was LSD. Every time you have a new tool in, in science, uh, new areas open up for study, like when the microscope came into medicine and biology, or when the, when the telescope came into, into um, astronomy, entirely new domains of observation open up. 
Um, I worked for a little over two years on this map and when I finally had it together so that it covered all the major types of experiences that we see in non-ordinary states, it also dawned on me that this was not a new map at all, that this was a rediscovery and kind of modern uh, reformulation of a map that in, in various uh, variations, modifications, uh, existed really not for centuries but possibly for millennia. This is what Aldous Huxley called uh, perennial philosophy. And uh, I saw the link to yoga, to uh, Tibetan Buddhism, to Sufism, to Christian mysticism, uh, the Kabbalah, I mean, you name it, shamanism. Stan, could you say a little bit more about the perinatal states? Yes, the perinatal level of the unconscious would be the first level that uh, we find in the psyche when we transcend biography, postnatal uh, biography. Uh, I think I will explain the term first. Uh, it's a, it's a Greek-Latin term composed of the prefix peri, which means around or near, and uh, the Latin natalis, which means uh, uh, pertaining to childbirth. And this is used in medicine to describe uh, situations and, and conditions uh, associated uh, with birth, with biological birth, something that immediately precedes, is associated with and immediately follows uh, biological birth. So. Uh, the obstetricians talk about perinatal hemorrhage, perinatal infection, perinatal brain damage. Of course, you never hear about perinatal experiences because the idea in um, Western medicine is that uh, there's no consciousness at birth. Uh, uh, birth doesn't matter, it's not uh, recorded, it's not experienced. And so you talk about conditions but not experiences. So the, the new thing here is that we discovered that actually the entire process of birth is recorded with all the emotions, with all the uh, physical sensations and even other elements like, um, for example, the anesthesia that was used or the forceps that was used and so on. And it um, constitutes a, a, an important part of an entire domain in the unconscious that I call perinatal because it seems to be related to the trauma of, of birth. Now, when people are reliving um, birth, it has two different aspects. One of them is like a replay of what happened to them biologically when they were children. But the other fascinating aspect of it is that um, there's also a very rich uh, symbolic imagery that comes with it, uh, which cannot be derived from birth, but it's coming from what Jung would call the collective unconscious. For example, um, uh, certain historical images or certain mythological images. So, for example, somebody reliving uh, the situation when, uh, where as fetus uh, they were um, trapped in the womb, where the, the uterus was contracting, but the cervix was not open, it's a kind of no exit situation, would experience themselves not only as a fetus, but simultaneously or in a kind of alternating fashion also identify, let's say, with prisoners throughout history or people who were tortured by the Inquisition or um, uh, inmates in the concentration camp, uh, you know, people in dungeons and so on, or even trapped animals. Or it will open up into the mythological uh, aspect of the collective unconscious and they would identify um, with some figures representing eternal torture. You know, the Greeks have those kinds of figures, uh, uh, Sisyphus, uh, Tantalos, Prometheus, you know, powerful images of suffering that will never end. Uh, or uh, they would even uh, identify with sinners in hell. They would have images actually uh, um, portraying hells as they are described in different cultures, Oriental or Islamic or Christian. Um, so it's very, very interesting uh, that, that in the context of reliving of biological birth, there's an opening into the collective unconscious. When, let's say, the, the process moves and uh, they would be reliving the stage where the child was fighting to get through the birth canal when the cervix was already dilated, was open, uh, there would be other kinds of images. For example, suddenly there would be images of revolutions. French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, enough of oppression, 
we are going to overthrow the tyrant, we are going to free ourselves, we are going to all breathe freely, those are the slogans in all uh, major uh, revolutions. And again, in terms of the um, mythological unconscious, or archetypal, as Jung calls it, suddenly there would be um, um, mythological images of deities representing death, rebirth. Because our own you know, model in this culture, the Judeo-Christian uh, culture, would be Christ, Christ's suffering, death on the cross, and then resurrection. But some other people would go into other cultures, whether they know them intellectually or not, whether they're familiar with those uh, mythologies. So, for example, uh, Osiris would be the, the Egyptian counterpart, uh, or it could be Attis, Adonis, it could be Dionysus, and so on. This comes from different cultures, again, from the, from, um, the archetypal aspect, the mythological aspect of the collective unconscious. So this is a very, very important uh, domain in the psyche, and a full conscious experience of that level leads uh, to the mystical spiritual opening. You use the term re-experiencing or reliving experiences as opposed to simply remembering experiences. Is that an important yes. distinction? Well, this is very, very characteristic and very important for the work with non-ordinary states, where in verbal psychotherapy you typically recall, remember, or not even that, you might just reconstruct indirectly. You work with your dreams and then you, you infer that something happened or you analyze neurotic symptoms. So it's, in verbal therapy it's, it's remembering and reconstructing, whereas in non-ordinary states you can actually relive, which means for all practical purposes uh, you'll be back there. You'll feel like a little child trapped in the birth canal and that reality will be more important to you than the fact that you're lying on the mattress as an adult and doing some breathing or listening to music or, or taking a substance. And in the process of re-experiencing, people can actually connect with other cultures with which they weren't even familiar intellectually or cognitively before they went into these days. Yes, you see, in, uh, uh, in the perinatal sessions you get the mixture of the biological but also um, the elements from the collective unconscious that can be coming from history, where you suddenly are in another culture, uh, in another century, or the experience takes you into the mythological aspect of the collective unconscious, and you would be connecting with mythological realms, with, with mythological personages. And what the absolutely fascinating aspect to this is that people can actually get new information about areas that they've never studied. Can you give me an example? Well, you can have, uh, for example, somebody who would suddenly have an encounter with a deity of, uh, of a certain culture. They would, let's say, be in, uh, stuck in the birth canal and suddenly there would be a vision of an underworld with, with deities. And they uh, would be able to perceive the deities, they'll be able to talk about them, they'll be able to draw their images afterwards, and they might be able to say uh, it was like something uh, Middle Eastern, something possibly Babylonian, but uh, you know, this is all I can say about it. And then they go into the uh, handbook of mythology, Sumerian mythology, and they found out that for all practical purposes they have visited the Sumerian underworld. They sort of know the deities, they understood their functions. This all came from the collective unconscious. These are the kinds of experiences that led Carl Gustav Jung, the famous Swiss psychiatrist, to the assumption that we don't have just the Freudian individual unconscious, which is just sort of a reject of uh, uh, elements from our personal life, but that we have this incredible reservoir of information about the entire uh, cultural history of humanity. I'm not sure I see the difference between the images seen at the perinatal level and the transpersonal level. Well, you see, the, the, as I said, the, the perinatal level of the unconscious is, for many people, a level on which they first encounter these archetypal mythological realities or things from other centuries and so on. Then, when it opens up into the transpersonal level, then you get these elements in a pure form. The, the biological, uh, the birth-related disappears from that, and then you're dealing with uh, mythological realities, you're dealing with experiences of other cultures, uh, sometimes it was a, was a sense of personal memory, then people talk about past life experiences, karmic 
experiences, or you can suddenly identify with animals. You can have very authentic experience of being a pregnant whale or being an eagle soaring you know, above a mountain. You can have an experience of being a hungry turtle. I mean, you can just become anything that is part of space-time or that is part of the um, mythological realm of the collective unconscious. This is so difficult for those of us brought up in the Western scientific tradition to even acknowledge the existence of these things or to try to fit them into our beliefs that it's, it's tempting to think that psychedelic substances or these rituals may induce a sort of non-critical kind of uh, imaginary state in which people have such vivid images that they actually believe that they are real. That seems in some ways more credible than to believe that they actually are real. I mean, are they real or are they purely imagination? Well, you know, these experiences are known to traditional psychiatrists and there are, you know, some uh, nuances in uh, the positions in relation to these experiences. Uh, one extreme position is uh, these are all um, psychotic phenomena and the idea is that some kind of pathological process acts on the brain and it just comes up with this kind of phantasmagoria that really doesn't have any any meaning and these states are not uh, worth studying which is pretty much what has been done uh, now it's to me it's bizarre to try to explain these experiences by brain pathology you know if we can look at a computer I mean if you if you damage a computer all that you're gonna get is a jangled program you don't you're not gonna get another strange comprehensive program so the idea that some kind of pathological process influences the brain and makes you identify with the dancing Shiva and suddenly you will understand everything about um, what is there to know about that aspect of Hinduism. It's just not a very scientific and very believable way of thinking. It, it, as long as we are stuck with the, with the kind of materialistic paradigm, we don't have many alternatives. Another, uh, another way of looking at it would be, and, and some people say, well, these experiences are very interesting, but basically nothing new can be, be discovered in these states. In other words, if there is some information, it must have come into the brain in this lifetime through the ordinary channels. People like uh, Carl Sagan, would, when they respond to this material, or even Margaret Mead, with whom I discussed it, they say, well, you know, in our culture, children watch, I don't know, six to eight hours of television a day. They are exposed to a lot of stuff at school. They go to movies. They, they read books and so on. And somehow the brain records it all. And then in an ordinary state, it all gets sort of mixed up. And then it sort of gets, gets kind of recombined. And you get these stories that, that have some element of truth. But, but whatever is relevant information in it, must have come from a NOVA program or, you know, mm -hmm. this, this cannot be uh, just sort of a direct uh, access to information about the, about the cosmos. Now I have, uh, when I talk to audiences and particularly to people who are, you know, this inquiring skeptics, uh, it's very difficult to convey to them something that in me took a long process. I mean, I have been studying on ordinary states for 37 years, you know, almost, almost daily. And so uh, when I say something like this, this is, I can back it in my own memory by hundreds of stunning observations where it was very, very unlikely that people could get access to this information. And then I, I'm in a position where I have to condense it in a couple of sentences and sort of shoot it at somebody. And of course it's implausible. I mean, it took me, you know, years even having the experiences and seeing them daily in other people, the, the straitjacket of the Cartesian Newtonian thinking that I was brought up with, you know, in medical studies and so on, was so strong that I would first question my sanity and, and my own observations before I would question that system. So you can see why these ideas are difficult to accept. You went through the same process yourself having been scientifically trained, actually in Czechoslovakia, which I understand is also officially atheistic. We really got the pure materialistic doctrine, like everything that smacked of mysticism or idealism was, was either uh, censored out or it was ridiculed. Uh, now, uh, you know, there is an interesting point, which is uh, when those experiences uh, happen to 
to try to really um, assess whether or not the person could have had access to that information. And in some, you know, some experiences it's not uh, necessarily uh, easy or it's not possible even. But there are, once in a while, there is an observation that's really so astonishing that uh, it just doesn't leave you any other explanation, that there is a serious phenomenon that deserves to be, to be studied. I had situations where people would experience something from the 17th century and trace themselves to a particular person, and then a father who, whom they haven't seen uh, since uh, they were three years old, when the father left, in the meantime did a family pedigree, which you can do in, in Europe, because the, the birth records are kept. And they would meet the father after having had these experiences, and the father would show them the, the pedigree and tell them that their, that their family actually had this ancestor, you know, with whom they identified. Or there was another experience which was from the Spanish-English War where uh, somebody relieved himself as a priest who was with uh, Spanish soldiers in a fortress which seemed to be in Ireland and they all got killed. As one of the visions he saw his uh, seal ring with initials and he painted it actually after the session and then later was able to find out um, in um, historical archives that he was actually experiencing uh, elements of a specific battle, he was able to uh, find out that these soldiers had a priest with them and got the name of the priest and the initials of the priest's name actually matched the initials that he painted on this seal ring. So those are peculiar synchronicities and you know just to say this is, this is coincidence is very very uh, Unlikely. Can you think of any other experiences that simply can't be explained by our normal scientific view of the dimensions of the psyche? I can, I can think of at least one, one very significant category of experiences, and those are out-of-body experiences. We have seen that in uh, the breath work, we have seen it in psychedelic sessions, and there's a very, very important domain where they are observed uh, quite regularly and that's thanatology, which is the science of dying, death and dying. And those are experiences where people simply leave their body and they can perceive um, the, the environment from some uh, other angle, or they can even uh, perceive something in remote locations. So there's now increasing number of observations of people who experienced uh, uh, near death or clinical death experience, for example, on an operation table. And while the, the team is trying to uh, resuscitate them, they have an experience of their consciousness uh, separating from the body and kind of floating around and maybe precipitating near the ceiling. And then they are watching uh, the scene with a kind of detached interest so that when they come back to consciousness, they are able to exactly reconstruct what was happening as they saw it from the vantage point of view of the ceiling. Uh, it's possible for consciousness to go to another room of the building or maybe, maybe even to a location which is 200 miles away and give an accurate perception of something that can later be verified. And there are now indications that there might be possible for people who are congenitally blind for organic reasons to actually be able to optically perceive uh, the, the environment under these circumstances and then lose uh, the ability to see when they reconnect with their body. So those are very easily uh, verifiable experiences and there's simply no way you could, you could uh, account for it in the traditional thinking where consciousness is something that's produced by the brain, that's, that's bound to the brain because it shows that, that human consciousness can clearly function uh, independently of the brain uh, and um, retain all the perceptual qualities. We touched briefly on the experiences in the transpersonal realm. Can these experiences be categorized in some way? Yes, I can think about uh, three large categories of transpersonal experiences. Uh, in the first one, uh, it would be primarily uh, the, the spatial boundaries that would be transcended. You know, uh, 
Uh, Alan Watts talked about the fact that uh, in everyday life we experience ourselves as skin encapsulated egos, <laughs> as if we were sort of Newtonian objects. Uh, we are enclosed in the skin, uh, and something that's quarter of an inch from our fingertip is not us anymore. So in this first category, we transcend this sense of identity. It's as if our consciousness uh, our, and sense of identity is kind of leaking out of the skin encapsulated ego and we can become other people or become unified with other people or experience a group consciousness, experience ourselves as all the mothers of the world or all the children or all the soldiers of the world. Um, or we can even experience uh, identification with the entire humanity. These kinds of experiences have been described in the spiritual scriptures of the world, saints, prophets, and so on. And this can go beyond the, the human boundaries, and we have seen a number of people identifying with animals, again, in a very, very authentic way, where they can find new things about those animals by becoming the animals, understanding how the eagle works, the air currents to fly, or uh, experience in their genital area what it is like when a whale delivers the, the calf, and so on. And again, I could give examples if we had more, more time. I described it in the book, The Adventure of Self-Discovery, in some details. Uh, um, and it can go even beyond the animal realm into uh, the botanical realm, or identification with different aspects of, of nature, even inorganic uh, nature. So that's the first category. In the second, it's more transcending the limitations of linear time. So in everyday consciousness, we experience, if you think about it, with all our senses, always only the present moment and the present location. Five minutes from now, this will be past. This will be a memory for us. And we certainly cannot experience the future. Whereas in non-ordinary states, it is as if suddenly you can go back into history. We, we gave a few examples before. Uh, or uh, it, it is as if you pull the, the past into the present moment. So you can be suddenly in the French Revolution as if it were happening now. And sometimes people have a sense of personal owning of that experience. They say, I actually feel that I once was that person. And that's where they talk about past lives, about karmic experiences. And finally, the third category of transpersonal experiences is the one that we also touched upon, and that was uh, the archetypal the mythological level, where suddenly you encounter uh, deities from different cultures or demons, or you visit some mythological realms, paradises, heavens, as they are presented in different cultures. And you, you can have adventures in those mythological realms, again, with the ability to derive completely new information about these mythological realms, which for the Western cultures don't really exist at all. They are not real. But in non-ordinary states, they are just like another television channel. You know, this is channel under 27, <laughs> and that one is um, 18 or 17 or whatever. What do you see as some of the implications of this model to the understanding of psychosomatic disorders or emotional problems? Yes, in, uh, in traditional psychiatry, again, the idea is that if a problem does not have a, an organic base, it's not due to a tumor or infection or something in that category, that the whole story is in infancy, childhood, and later life. In other words, it's biographically determined. The traumas that you had as an infant, as a child, things that happened uh, later to you in life should, be, should give you the total uh, understanding and also work with that material, should be able to heal, to influence those things therapeutically. Now, if you work with non-ordinary states, you find out it's not the whole story. The, the, not only is the, is the model of the psyche uh, much, much larger, but it gives you a much, uh, much more complex image of what we call traditional psychopathology. So if you work on a problem like uh, uh, phobia, like uh, asthma or some other psychosomatic uh, issue, um, on your anger, aggression, uh, you will find out that you always find something in your life, in childhood, in infancy, but that's not the whole story. You find something that's meaningfully related to the problem. But if the process deepens and continues, you'll find out that the same problem is also linked to a certain facet or a certain aspect or a certain stage of the birth process. And then 
even further, you'll discover that there are still additional routes uh, on the transpersonal level for the same problem. And the resolution comes, for example, in um, connection with a past life experience, what people, what people would see as past life experience. Or part of your work on the anger would involve identification with animals, with wolves, with uh, um, some kind of uh, predator felines and so on. Uh, or uh, you will have to um, allow a Jungian archetype to uh, emerge fully. In other words, uh, the resolution will come in connection with some mythological realities. So the symptoms in this understanding have a kind of multi-level, multi-dimensional structure. And in order to really get rid of them in a relatively short time, you have to have a broad enough context that uh, allows people to have any kind of experiences that seem to be meaningfully related to this uh, symptom. With this new model of the psyche, what implications does this have for therapeutic strategies to help people deal with these problems? We have uh, the situation in contemporary psychiatry, which uh, we, we briefly mentioned before, that, you know, as many different ideas about therapy as there are schools. So for the same problem, depending on where you go, you would get a totally different treatment. Uh, the work with non-ordinary states kind of gives us some uh, interesting insights what, what a significant alternative might be. And it supports something that was already said before by Carl Gustav Jung. Um, basically, that it's not possible to fix somebody's psyche by using your intellect. Because the intellect is just a small fraction of the psyche. The psyche in this understanding, or the Jungian understanding, uh, is cosmic. It's anima mundi, as uh, you know, the, the, the mind of the universe, as uh, Jung calls it. And so it's impossible to use a fragment of the psyche and, and think that you're going to understand the totality of the psyche or that you're going to be able to manipulate the, the psyche in any way uh, you would like to. Now, the significant alternative that appears in non-ordinary states is that the non-ordinary states seem to function, seems to function like a radar. It sort of scans your psyche and your body and finds the areas where there are problems, which means where there is a lot of trapped energy, emotional or physical energy, will sort of bring these uh, elements in the unconscious into consciousness for uh, working through, for resolution, for integration. Uh, so that these non-ordinary states automatically activates something like uh, um, inner healing intelligence, an inner healer, if you want to personify it. And as the experiences are unfolding, it is the healing process itself. The symptoms will actually get transformed into various experiences, some of them biographical, some of them perinatal, some of them transpersonal. But um, the, uh, the process itself decides where to go first, what follows. Uh, in other words, the healing is unfolding quite spontaneously, and the task of the healer, of the therapist, is then to develop trust to the process and support unconditionally what is happening, whether we understand it or not. This must be a very difficult leap for some therapists to come to the therapeutic situation with some model in their mind of what the problem is and how to convince the client that he has this problem. It must be very difficult to trust the process so implicitly that the inner healer will somehow emerge and resolve the situation. Yes, you know, we have a training in uh, the holotropic breathwork. Uh, we get a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists and uh, social workers and so on. And for, for many of them, the problem is unlearning as much as learning new things or even more. I would think it would be particularly hard to see the symptoms as the emerging healing process when the first thing some psychiatrists do is give tranquilizers or drugs to suppress the symptoms, as though the symptoms were the problem. You see, the philosophy in uh, the work with non-ordinary states can be called homeopathic. In the system called homeopathy, the idea is that the symptoms are manifestations of the healing process. They are not the problem, or they're the problem as well as a manifestation of the healing process. So in uh, uh, the homeopathic strategy, you want to activate the symptoms, amplify the symptoms. And this is what happens automatically in non-ordinary states. 
the symptoms before getting result, they get actually accentuated. Whereas in, in uh, psychiatry we confuse uh, the mitigation of symptoms with healing, which is uh, not the case. The implications of what we're saying here challenge our normal view of reality. So how can we redefine our view of reality to be compatible with these insights? You see, I, I brought the uh, observations from psychedelic research to the United States, and very early after I came to this country, I connected with Abraham Maslow and Tony Sutich, who are the founders of a uh, movement in psychology called humanistic psychology. And then uh, 10 years after the development of humanistic psychology, they felt there was still something missing. Humanistic psychology talked about self-actualization, self-realization, brought experiential techniques into psychotherapy and so on. But uh, they realized that was, there was still some significant aspect of human nature that was not represented, and that was spirituality. And they started thinking about uh, a new, yet a new movement uh, in psychology that they wanted to call transhumanistic. And they invited me to uh, groups which uh, did kind of brainstorming about this new discipline that would really cover the whole spectrum of human experience. And they finally accepted the term that I was using for this one category of experiences, which is transpersonal. So, and they formulated the, the, the basic principles of what we call now transpersonal psychology, which brings in science and spirituality. Now, at the beginning, uh, the transpersonal psychology was kind of consistent in itself, made a lot of sense, you know, healed some of the problems in old psychology and psychiatry by making it uh, transcultural, bringing respect to other traditions, to the whole spiritual history of humanity rather than pathologizing it. But there was this problem of this incredible gap between transpersonal psychology and what was considered science, which was this 17th century Cartesian Newtonian materialistic science. Now, the very exciting thing that started happening then was that um, uh, books started appearing discussing revolutionary developments in other disciplines. For me, extremely important was Fritjof Capra's book, The Tao of Physics, showing the worldview emerging from quantum relativistic physics and showing the tremendous convergence with the mystical systems and for me also with the observations from uh, transpersonal psychology from non-ordinary states. And then came things like Carl Pribram's uh, holographic model of the brain, uh, David Bohm's um, theory of hollow movement or a holographic uh, model of the universe. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake came in biology with his idea of morphogenetic fields that Western science has really never explained the problem of, of pattern, of form, of order. And then this must be governed by some fields that, that uh, Western science uh, doesn't, doesn't work with, uh, doesn't know how to measure. And he called them morphogenetic uh, fields, fields creating uh, form. Uh, there were other developments, the chaos theory, uh, Prigogine, uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist, uh, um, developed certain concepts in thermodynamics, which were again pointing to an entirely new worldview. So we have now something that has been called uh, the emerging paradigm, emerging worldview in Western science, in contrast with, the, with this Newtonian Cartesian worldview. And what has been extremely uh, exciting for me is that every new development of this kind was undermining uh, the, the kind of uh, mechanistic, materialistic worldview as we know it, but was perfectly compatible with transpersonal psychology and with the kind of material coming out from non-ordinary states. So I believe now that some time from now we'll actually have a completely new comprehensive scientific worldview of which actually transpersonal psychology and the material from non-ordinary states will be a kind of integral part of. It seems ironic to me that your concepts were initially rejected as unscientific, but now the scientists themselves, particularly the modern physicists, are publishing theories that seem to be completely compatible with your ideas. That's right. That's, that's very much the situation we're seeing. Yeah. Fascinating. So let's talk about how you're doing therapy today, given 
all this experience with non-ordinary states of consciousness, going clear back to the late 50s with your research on LSD and up to the present, you've devoted your life to this study. How are you applying it today to your therapeutic work? Well, in the uh, about the last 17 years, you know, since the time when it became more and more difficult to work with psychedelics, uh, my wife Christina and I have developed a um, method which is non-pharmacological but uses non-ordinary states and the way we induce them is extremely simple. It's actually um, by faster breathing, by powerful evocative music and then a certain kind of uh, bodywork that we are using and we basically see the same kind of spectrum of experiences that we used to see in uh, psychedelic sessions, which is very exciting because to the extent to which there were the least doubts that what was coming up, uh, these types of experiences were really authentic manifestations of the psyche, that this might, have, might be uh, toxic artifacts, you know, something that a drug is doing to the brain. If you get the same experiences with something as elementary, as simple, as normal as breathing, uh, this is something that you have to take into consideration. You can ignore observations uh, from uh, the work with an exotic group of substances, but you cannot ignore what happens to people when they do a little more breathing. And what do you see as the broader implications of this work? Well, I'm very concerned about the situation in the world, as we all are, you know, about the crisis that we are uh, facing on a global scale. And I think many people in the transpersonal field, including myself, uh, feel that uh, there's not much hope if we approach this problem just with the strategies that are an extension of the old strategies that created the problems in the first place, uh, the ecological problems, the political crisis, and so on. And uh, I think the, the feeling is that um, basically the crisis reflects a certain stage of evolution of the human species, evolution of consciousness, and that to really change the situation in the world, some kind of deep inner transformation has to come. And I see really the work with non-ordinary states to be uh, one of the very significant uh, ways of, of inner transformation in the right direction, whether we are talking about systematic spiritual practice, whether we are talking about uh, uh, work with some powerful forms of um, experiential psychotherapy, like the holotropic breath work, uh, whether we are talking about uh, participation in shamanic rituals with some uh, you know, Aboriginal cultures, or even proper support for people who have spontaneous uh, um, crises of spiritual opening. Many of those people these days are, are hospitalized and uh, get tranquilizers, uh, and I believe that these, these states can be supported in a way that uh, is conducive to healing and to transformation. Christine and I are using the term spiritual emergencies for these states of psycho-spiritual crisis. So if we, if we look at, at it from the, from the global point of view, it's very, very exciting for me to see that so many people these days are getting somehow involved in in serious self-exploration, uh, including self-exploration that uh, includes non-ordinary states of consciousness. For more information on the use of non-ordinary states of consciousness in psychotherapy, write to Groff Transpersonal Training, 20 Sunnyside Avenue, A314, Mill Valley, California, 94941, or call area code 415 383 8779